I like to be the one to start things up, so let's see what happens. Okay, it didn't work. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> Usually works. Right? <laughs> okay, to look you out there. You did, you did. <laughs> Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sarah Brooks, and I am the chair of the Grandview College Republican Chapter. I would th like to thank all the executive officers of our chapter um, who have worked hard over the past few months to make this event possible. Um, thank you to all the candidates who took time out of their schedule to be here tonight, and I would love to thank each of you personally, but that would mean that we'd be here for a really long time, and we have questions to get to. <laughs> Everyone probably has opinions on different issues and are wanting answers on various topics. Hopefully the questions put forth tonight will help towards your decisions in the future. This debate can play an important role in the political process leading up to the June primary and the November election. Someone is going to be elected into office later this year, and we as citizens and voters deserve answers towards what will happen with our money, how our liberties and freedoms will be preserved, and how our elected officials will uphold the Constitution. That's why I'm personally involved, and that's why I believe that we've worked so hard to put this event together, and why all of you are here tonight. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for choosing to spend the evening here with us, and let me introduce you to our Grandview University College of Hogan co-chair, Alec Kennedy. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Alec Kennedy. I am the co-chair of the American University College Republicans. Um, I am just going to give a brief introduction of each of the candidates here tonight. Um, Sam Clovis. Uh, Sam is from rural Kansas. He is a tenured professor at a private liberal arts college in northwest Iowa. He received his degree in political science and a commission as a second lieutenant and had a career with the uh, Air Force for 25 years. Sam earned his MBA from Golden State University and studied at Georgetown University in the National Security Program. He earned his doctorate in public administration from the University of Alabama and went into higher education. Next is Scott Shaven. Scott is a native of Western Iowa. Born in Harlan, Iowa in 1974, Scott attended Carroll Quimper Catholic High School. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1993 and served until his honorable discharge in 1999 so he could attend college. He is a graduate of Iowa State University, earning his BS degree in marketing. After graduation, Scott worked as a sales professional in his family business until 2006, when he started his career in the automotive industry. He has served as a sales manager for a dealership in Ames since March of 2009. Matt Whitaker. Matt is a sixth generation Iowan and a small business owner. Matt grew up in Ankeny, Iowa, and graduated from the University of Iowa with both an MBA and a law degree. He was an academic All-American and a member of the last Hawkeye Rose Bowl football team. He worked for over five years on behalf of Iowans as the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Iowa. Matt prosecuted cases in important areas such as national security, immigration, income tax, and firearms. Now that the candidates have been introduced, let me go ahead and introduce Todd Nielsen, our marketing officer, and our moderator for tonight. Thank you, Alec. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the debate. Uh, first things first, um, if you have Twitter, you can feel free to hashtag GVCR debate throughout the debate. Um, please be appropriate, obviously. Uh, we, we, we'd like to see how many responses we get, so um, if you would like to, feel free to do that. Um, just a quick rundown as to how the debate will be conducted. Um, each question will be asked to each candidate uh, there will be 90 seconds for each candidate to respond um, with a 30 second rebuttal. Um, that rebuttal time is only allowed if a specific candidate is directly mentioned with, um, like within the response of, of the, to the, within the response to the question, sorry. Um, we will run left to, well, right to left, I guess, um, in alphabetical order with the first question and then reverse the order for the next question. Um, 
and then back in, alphab in alphabetical order for the next question, so on and so forth. Um, the Grandview students have put these questions together, and uh, hopefully, with time permitting, we will have enough time for all of the questions to be asked to all of the candidates. Um, time will start once each candidate starts speaking. A 30-second warning will be given via a yellow sign, um, and each candidate stops speaking once the red sign is held up by the timekeeper, Stephanie Smith. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we're ready to start the questions. All right, so the first question for tonight is, um, Americans now own more in student loans than credit cards or car loans. Student loans often follow individuals for most of their lives and are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. Why is it that education is so expensive, and what is your solution for making higher education more affordable for students? Thank you for having us here this evening, and I, I just want to make a comment right up front. Uh, you got to be present to win. Um, <laughs> well, I'm a college professor, so I, I'm deeply involved in this, this process, and uh, one of the things I would like to uh, offer you is the fact that uh, any time the United States government offers uh, an increase in, let's say, the size of a loan that could be had or the size of a subsidy that's there, or increases the Pell Grant, what do you think the universities and colleges do? They increase it by exactly that amount. There is no risk assigned at the college. The risk is assigned between you and the United States government. The government then pursues you to repay these loans. And every time there is a, a, a notion of a benefit offered, i.e. to increase the amount of money that you have available to you, tuitions go up by exactly that amount. I think the best thing for us to do is to get the government out of the loan business, assign risk, uh, or assign risk at the college level so that the university or the colleges take on the risk of the loan themselves. That way they have an incentive to keep you there, they have an incentive to uh, lower prices, and it increases competition. And I think this is exactly what we ought to be doing. Get the government out of this business altogether. Let you deal with private enterprise or deal directly with the college and let the colleges indemnify. Thank you very much for the question. The, uh, when, when you, when you, when, first off, when you're talking about student loans and, and then sticking with you for life, I think one of the biggest things you gotta make sure, first off, is educating the person that's signing on for the loan. And sitting down and, and, and having a process in place where you educate the person and you let them know, you can't file bankruptcy and have that loan forgiven. The only way to, get a student loan off your credit bureau is to either pay it off, die, or have the school go out of business within six months. You sit down and explain that to a 19 year old, let them know that you're not getting out of it. You're stuck with this thing until it's paid off. And <clears throat> so, so that's the first part of it. The other thing you have to do is sit down and also talk with people and ask them about the value of it. Why is college expensive? Well, what are you going to get in return? If you don't finish college, you're going to get nothing in return. If you do finish college, you're going to at least have that bullet on the, on the resume, which is going to be a lot better than people who don't have that. Thank you. College is the gateway to the middle class and really to success. But it doesn't have to be. We've seen many college dropouts and folks go to college that, that didn't go to college to be successful in starting a business. And one of the things we need is we do need to get the federal government out. In 2009, we essentially had a federal government takeover of our student loan program, and we've seen prices jump up 25%. Um, and I look at someone like my brother-in-law, who has struggled for a lot of his adult life uh, with student loan debt uh, that has been as much or more than his house payment. And it has, it has actually, instead of, a, even though he is quite successful, it has been a anchor on things that he's wanted to do and opportunities that he may have taken. And so 
First thing is we need to increase competition. And, but we also need to make sure that the folks going to college understand that you don't have to borrow money. Um, some of you know that I had a unique way of paying for college. I was bigger and faster than my peers, and so I got a scholarship. But I hope you probably don't know that my wife Marcy worked at Iowa River Power Company and did and worked all summer to pay her way through college and took out very few student loans. So we need to encourage college students to work. And we need to make sure that places like Grandview University have tremendous opportunities, and I know they do, for their students to go work and be successful. All right. Did I go? Um, you <laughs> just hit it. I can't, I can't see her very well. So. <laughs> Is it? Did she move? Like, oh, it's right up in front? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, 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 no, that's fine. <clears throat> Much better. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to talk as long as Sam does. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so now for question number two. Um, what can we do here in Iowa to better protect life? Do you support a personhood bill? Well, we need a culture of life um, that encourages life. And, and I am 100% pro-life. I do support a personhood bill. Um, there are several that have, have been out there. I don't, uh, the person in bill I could imagine uh, is very similar to what Rand Paul has proposed in the United States Senate. Senator Grassley has signed on. And, uh, you know, I see that as a, as a really good bill. I don't want to criminalize um, females uh, that find themselves in, uh, in crisis. Uh, but at the same time, I do believe life begins at conception. And I do believe that the constitutional protections of life um, should be in place, and, and that could be accomplished through a bill in the uh, United States Congress. Yes, I support a personhood amendment. Um, I am pro-life. The biggest way to protect it here in the state of Iowa, and or as a federal, as a federally elected official, would be to use the Hyde Amendment as your biggest hammer. Um, the Hyde Amendment stops federal funding of abortions and right now you could use it in conjunction with the Affordable Care Act because in theory if everybody should have insurance there should not be a need for any of these neighborhood clinics because everybody should have insurance so if everybody has insurance these neighborhood clinics won't need any federal funding continually and like I said continuing to use the Hyde Amendment as your biggest hammer to stop federal funding to go anywhere Near abortion. Thank you. And this is great. We got asked this question on uh, Monday night in another forum, and uh, I, I, I want to talk to you as the as a elected United States Senator. Uh, I think that we could use the model of, of uh, DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, to uh, advance a, a uh, act uh, from the Congress uh, on personhood uh, that provides federal protection uh, then for persons at the federal level. Uh, the other aspect of this is the selection of judges and justices uh, exercising our Article 3, Section 2 responsibilities to shape the courts accordingly. Uh, my view of, of a litmus test for a judge, and I do have one, is whether or not they can explain adequately natural law and natural rights. If they can't do that, they have no business sitting on the bench. The issues that come back then, if we establish federal personhood, then we then have a heavy hammer to come back and help the states move forward individually uh, to bring forward personhood amendments uh, inside each state. And then from when we have that capability and the personhood amendments there, then the law can be structured appropriately. Thank you. Question number three. Um, the Federal Reserve's role in the U.S. economy is substantial. Should the Federal Reserve be audited? Why or why not? I'd be audited every two years and the odd years. Uh, I believe that in that, that the transparency of the Federal Reserve is one of the biggest uh, problems that we have. Uh, if you all remember back to uh, TARP, uh, the, uh, the notion was that we had $700 billion uh, in funds authorized uh, through the Federal Reserve to help support these major financial institutions. The truth of the matter was there was $7 trillion processed through the Fed uh, to support this. Uh, that's egregious, that's wrong, and somebody ought to be in jail for that. 
But the Federal Reserve uh, is, was established to help establish a national banking system and a secure financial system. I don't see that. But I will say this, that without strong fiscal policy on the part of Congress to complement the, the uh, monetary policy that the Fed is re required to administer, then, then the, the Fed then ends up shooting all their bolt, and that's where we are today. $62 billion being printed in money. If we had fundamental tax reform in the United States, corporations could bring that money back from overseas. There'd be no need to print the money, and we would have the ability then uh, to expand our economy and get the uh, growth of the economy uh, past where it is right now, because right now uh, what the Fed is doing is diluting money. It's like Kool-Aid. If you go out there and take the uh, a, a standard Kool-Aid package and you put it in five gallons of water, it doesn't look like Kool-Aid, doesn't taste like Kool-Aid, it's not Kool-Aid. And that's what's happening with our uh, Fed Reserve. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but the way I understand it, the Federal Reserve has already audited. Their balance sheets are published annually, and they're put online weekly the way I understand it. If the way I understand what the people are asking for is an audit of the decision-making process of those that are currently in the Federal Reserve. And you have to understand the Federal Reserve was set up to be a nonpartisan uh, agency. So then you have to ask yourself, do you really want to have, let's just hypothetically say, accidentally, nobody on this stage becomes your next United States Senator. Do you want to have someone, to, to use their verbiage, someone who is not an accountant, is not an economist, doesn't have an advanced degree in economy, asking economists why they made a decision the way they did regarding fiscal policy. The whole purpose of the Federal Reserve, the biggest point of the Federal Reserve is to dictate, economic, is to dictate monetary policy for low unemployment and to, to audit people's decision-making process is something I wouldn't want to get into. Yes, we should audit the Fed, but what we really need to do is this Federal Reserve centralized banking experiment has failed, and we need to get real value behind our dollar. Something, whether it's a gold standard or a gold collar or a commodities basket, something of real value to back the United States dollar. Um, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate, low inflation and um, full employment, which I would, you know, sort of, I would like to get rid of the Federal Reserve, audit it at a minimum. But I would also like to get rid of the dual mandate. I think they should, if they're going to manage our nation's um, economy at all, and I don't think central bank can really do that because I believe in entrepreneurship and innovation, and that actually can't be managed from a central location. But that being said, I would like to see an individual, a single mandate, and that being inflation only. Um, you know, we're, we, we've been in this extraordinary measures of quantitative easing and, um, and, and $55 billion a month, being, and it was up to as high as 85, and I'm not sure we really know, but we are right now defying gravity in our central bank. We all know how this story ends, and I think some in the room are like me, a little surprised as to how we can continue to have low inflation as we continue to pump this balloon full of air. And we're seeing it in various markets that are turning into bubbles, and I'm gravely concerned that if we don't get the Federal Reserve under control, they're going to have You're going to have to disaster. stop, I'm sorry. It's my turn again, so I'll it keep is, talking. It is. <laughs> I'll just go shorter. See, it's all going to average out. <laughs> All right, well, question number four then. Um, do you believe that states have the right to nullify unconstitutional laws? If a state degrees, disagrees with Obamacare or restrictions on medical marijuana, what rights do you think they should have? Nullification. Um, I, I, I think states uh, could try to nullify, but we have moved so beyond um, our constitutional framework that um, you know, really, the federalist system that Sorry, was imagined, when the states created the federal government, um, I, I, I continue to be worried that we've moved so far beyond that the states uh, are not willing to exercise that power for fear of what the federal government would do in response. Um, but the federal government is smart. What have they done? 
They attach strings. They don't just pass a law and mandate a state does something. They say, we really want you to expand Medicaid, for example, and then we put strings attached that, you know, we're going to pay for 95% or 90, whatever the percent. You just pay a little bit. And, uh, and so, I mean, I, I think nullification um, would be a brave and bold political act of our state leaders. Um, I, I don't see that you know, across the nation as I look at, at who we elect to statewide office. No, I don't. I I agree with Matt. I don't. I don't see nullification happening. Mostly, yeah. yeah eventually, you you got to end up having a respect for your federal government. And what you can do though is take the message from states like California and Washington and Colorado. And you have to have somebody that's going to be willing to go to D.C. and actually address the issues that are at hand. Those states do want those laws changed. And then you have to look at. The, 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 the feedback from the rest of the country. Do those laws need to be changed? Something needs to be happening at the federal level. And you get, right now, when it comes to marijuana laws, you're going to need action from the federal government. You're either going to have to enforce the law and have somebody like Janet Reno show up with her tanks and start arresting people, or the federal law is going to have to be changed. But something needs to be done, and you have to have people in D.C. that are willing to address the, the, the issues of the day. <clears throat> Yes, I think states have the right to nullify. We have never carried through a nullification act in this country uh, to its logical conclusion. Article, uh, the, amend, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments provide the states the authority uh, to exercise their rights to sue, uh, to do these things. Other actions are taken on the part of the state legislatures and then force the federal government to come and pursue and sue back to the states. Those things are in place. The best remedy for nullification and to keep states from having to nullify is make sure that the laws that we passed are constitutionally in the first place. I happen to be a federalism guy. I wrote my dissertation on federalism. I know a little bit about this. And I think that there's something that we probably ought to be able to, to do, and that's to do what Fred Thompson had introduced uh, in every year he was in the United States Senate. And that was an to come to the floor, ask the rules of the Senate to be that the, the constitutionality of a law must be established before it's allowed to be voted on on the floor of the Senate. If we were to do that, I think then we would save a lot of the grief and a lot of the cost of court cases because I do think the states have the absolute right to object to and throw back laws that are not appropriate for those states. The states know best what's best for the people in the states, and the Ninth and Tenth Amendments give them the authority to do that. All right, moving on along to question number five. Uh, we're just past tax day. In 1913, the 16th Amendment gave Americans an income tax. Do you support the repeal of the income tax? What can we do to lower the tax burden on Americans? Thank you so much for asking that. <laughs> Yesterday I had the uh, pleasure of uh, sitting in front of the um, Des Moines Register editorial board and um, I had one of the reporters ask me, why I was dressed all in black. And I said, I, I dress in black every April 15th um, as my uh, small form of protest against the uh, 16th Amendment. Uh, yes, I think the 16th Amendment ought to be repealed. And if we de if repeal the 16th Amendment, we get rid of the IRS. And this has long-term ramifications. I'm a, I am a, a, a fair tax guy. I believe in a fair tax, a national sales tax, uh, with all the structures that are appropriate to that. The reason I am for a fair tax and a national sales tax is because if we get rid of the IRS, we will then preserve the First Amendment of the Constitution. And you're asking yourself why. The First Amendment of the Constitution ensures that we will have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to draw grievances, because if we take the IRS out of the system, we no longer have the coercive power of the federal government with the ability to come in and take tax exempt status from our, our situations, pull our preachers, our priests, and our rabbis from the pulpits. This is why we must get rid of the 16th Amendment. The fair tax is the way to go. I could agree with getting rid of the 16th Amendment, and I could get, agree with getting rid of the IRS if there was something plausible in place for 
collecting taxes and being able to pay our bills. There, I do have a couple of problems with uh, the fair tax. I think it, I do think it's a great idea. However, there are a couple of things that I have a problem with that I need to have answered before supporting a fair tax. First one would be being what to do with the current assets that people have, whether it's $1,000 or $10,000 or a or million dollars. You eliminate the IRS and then you implement a fair tax overnight. Those people, when they go to spend that money, are going to be taxed once again. They're going to basically incur a double tax on, on money that's already been taxed. So there's a few things that I'd like to see worked out. Overall, though, our tax code does need to be made simpler, and, and uh, we do need to close loopholes. We've got to figure, when, anytime there's a loophole, why is there a loophole? Who's the special interest? What are they benefiting, and what's the true benefit of it? Our tax code, some of you may have heard me say this before, our tax code has about five times the number of words as the Bible and none of the good news. <laughs> I would support a fair tax um, under one condition, and that is you guarantee me that the federal government doesn't have a, just another vein to tap into and tax you more. Because this federal government, throughout the course of our nation's history, has always and continued to ask for more. You know, today, at a federal, state, and local level, our tax burden is the highest it's ever been in our nation's history. And a, a, a national sales tax is a good idea. Some of the details are really going to have to be worked out. Um, the closer it is to 15% versus 30%, that makes a huge difference in my mind. Um, I'm concerned as you approach 30% or, or even more on a sales tax that you would encourage black markets and, and those types of things. But you know. As, it, as with anything, some of the devil's in the details, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, and I would agree this IRS is just is lawless and they need to be um, put out of business, and we need a better system that works. I think any, you know, a tax, I, I support fundamental tax reform, and the only bad idea is an idea that doesn't make it simpler, fairer, and flatter. It's my turn again? It is your turn again. I got the second time, time that's it. <laughs> All right, question number six. Uh, what role do you believe the United States government has when it comes to support and funding to other countries? Do you believe American tax dollars should be invested in more foreign aid, less, or about the same? Well, I think we should stop giving foreign aid to countries that don't like us very much, uh, countries like Egypt. Uh, I've also been fairly outspoken uh, on our aid to the UN. We give about $4 billion of your tax dollars to the United Nations, which I don't think um, helps us very much. They pass things like the Convention on Small Arms and the UN Convention on uh, on, on the Child and the Agenda 21. And I mean, it's just just really uh, radical um, that are uh, ideas that are inconsistent with with American liberty and freedom. And so, uh, I would like to see less foreign aid. Um, I would like to see less involvement of our nation's military um, across the globe. And uh, those are a couple things um, that. That, that I believe. Um, fundamentally, we have to remember that every dollar we take and give to somebody else um, is a dollar we've had to take from a family. And it's a dollar that they can't go out to dinner with. It's a dollar that they can't hire a new employee for a small business, can't buy a new piece of equipment. And I think we need to be much more careful with every dollar we take from taxpayers um, because ultimately um, that's affecting everyone's lives and it's taking it away from families that need the most. I agree. The biggest thing we have to consider when looking at foreign aid is who are we giving it to and why are we giving it to them? Do they like us? What's their feelings towards us? The other thing is we must consider and we must figure out before we ever give a dollar of foreign aid is how to hold that money accountable and how to hold those supplies accountable. I encourage you to visit with people from countries that have received our foreign aid or received any products of ours to their country. I did this a couple weeks ago and I was caught completely flat-footed when, when the young man was explaining to me the foreign aid that we were providing his country was ending up on supermarket shelves and it was not making it to the right people. So if we're spending money to help out people of a country and it's not actually helping them out or it's only helping out a small group, then we need to rein in that money and stop spending. The biggest thing we need when it comes to foreign aid is accountability. <clears throat> <clears throat>
$48 million a year goes out in foreign aid, $17 billion in military sales, and $31 billion in uh, economic support. Uh, most of that money goes to countries that don't like us, and I think we ought to stop giving it to countries that don't like us. I have a little experience with this. Uh, I was a legitimized uh, government gun runner um, back in the 1990s. Uh, I sold military equipment. I sold ships, helicopters, rocket missile systems, rifles, ammunition, computer chips, everything you can imagine. And I sold it to countries that needed it and countries that are friends of ours today. That, to me, was a great investment. And we ought to have those investments that go into countries that support us and will support us in the United Nations. One of the most corrupt organizations I ever dealt with was the United Nations. I have never seen an organization more corrupt in my life. And I dealt with them on a daily basis. This is one of the reasons that we oftentimes lose track of our economic support that we give to countries because most of that economic support gets funneled into uh, UN programs or, as Scott suggests, ends up on the supermarket shelves or in the black market. I think the economic aid uh, probably needs to go only to the countries that really need it and countries that will support us in the United Nations. Otherwise, we shouldn't give a damn a nickel to anybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to make a small switch here and ask that Scott Shaven answer this question first. Um, the question is this, what role should the government play in the definition of marriage? If two gay individuals consider themselves as partners, how would you define that and what should the definition of marriage be? I don't think the government should be defining marriage. I think marriage is a, is a religious institution that needs to be worked out between two people and their uh, and their church. I don't think the government should be involved with marriage. Um, <clears throat> if you look at it, a marriage license is essentially a tax on a, on a religious sacrament. For myself, I want the government as far out of my church as possible. If they're going to start getting involved with one sacrament, what's to, ta what's to stop them from getting involved in a second sacrament? I understand the need to have an orderly society, but the fact of the matter is, when you start blending in religious sacraments and contract law, you get into a gray area and what's next? I'd like to have the government as far out of uh, marriage as possible. Thank you. I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. I believe that currently the Constitution does not address uh, marriage, and so it's an issue that is reserved to the states under the 10th Amendment. And I believe the only way we can change that is to amend the Constitution to define marriage as between a man and a woman. I, I think that I, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here because I don't think the issue that we're talking about here is really an issue of marriage. It is uh, about uh, individuals, uh, a very small minority of the people in this country, that want to uh, achieve uh, equal protection under the 14th Amendment and thus, again, turning uh, ourselves against the, this is an attack on religion uh, that we have. People that decide to live together can do so contractually. I could care less how that's done. But one, I'm a Catholic. I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. And I don't think anyone should ask me to defy my faith to accept um, uh, perhaps a social standard that might be invoked. I can't do that individually, and so I, I, I please ask not to be asked to do that. I think this is about the, the extension of 14th Amendment protections to people that choose to behave in a particular way, as opposed to people who have primary characteristics like disabilities, age, um, skin, uh, skin color, gender, military service, or religion that are protected classes under the 14th Amendment. And I don't think we need to establish a protected class based on behavior. All right, next question. Um, do you believe the war on drugs is working or not working? Are there any changes you would make? And what are your feelings on the use of medical marijuana as prescribed to patients by licensed doctors? Great of you to ask. Uh, one of the uh, conversations that I have been involved in, and with many of the people in this room, by the way, uh, since we started this campaign, uh, has been in taking a hard look at the reclassification of marijuana at the federal level and taking it off of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 
uh, class one um, uh, list. And then moving, once we move it off the class one list as a, as a drug, then marijuana becomes uh, handled differently, not only through a civil action, but also through the court system. This is a remarkable thing. Mar medical marijuana is another area that is emerging, and I would be able to support uh, the use of uh, the advancement of medical marijuana as long as the evidence continues to accumulate that medical marijuana is a valued and valuable medical treatment. We see this already, and this is, by the way, is one of the conditions for taking marijuana off of a class one substance. That's one of the criteria, and I would support that going forward. Again, this is an area where I think the states have an opportunity to exercise the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. To answer your first question, the war on drugs is not working. Um, regarding medical marijuana, this goes back to the, one of the first questions we were asked uh, regarding nullification. And marijuana is a prime example of something that, of, of the state sending a message to the federal government to change itself. I would be all in favor of reclassifying marijuana from a Schedule One narcotic to a, at least a Schedule Two, and that's what the states are telling. And for those of you that don't understand this, a Schedule One, the difference between a Schedule Two and a Schedule One narcotic, all Schedule One narcotics are illegal federally. Classifying marijuana as the same level as heroin and methamphetamine and cocaine. But yet, and, and, and in turn, making it a hard, labeling it a harsher drug than morphine or volume shows that some people don't understand drugs. And when you're getting the pushback from the states, it is something that needs, the, the reclassification is something that definitely needs to be looked at. But it has to be done with science, so too. Thank you. I'm sorry. I can ramble forever. <laughs> I have a friend, and some of you may have, met, may have met her, but Marie LaFrance has been an outspoken advocate on behalf of her son. A son who I've met, they've been at my house, who has a severe seizure disorder and is medically fragile. And it is believed uh, by Maria that uh, medical marijuana, or at least a derivative, would help her son change his entire life make him a little bit better, a little bit more normal, like my son. And I know Mayor Steve Garrett from West Des Moines has a daughter, and he's been an outspoken advocate for the same thing. And I just, I look at how unresponsive our elected officials have been to their plight, and pretty much told them, you know what, move out of state. If you want to take care, if you want to take care of your kid, Sell all your assets, sell your rental property, sell your business, move out of the state of Iowa. That's the solution right now from our elected officials in the state of Iowa. It's not good enough. We need to be more compassionate. And if there are things that maybe are a little taboo that could help those kids that are afflicted with severe seizure disorders, then we should do what's right and not play politics with this issue. Question number nine. The National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA, allows that the government can detain citizens without trial if they are suspected of terrorism. Is the infinite detention provision in the NDAA necessary to national security? If so, is it a violation of the Fifth Amendment? And where do you stand on the line between security and freedom? Well, I stand on the side of freedom, um, but at the same time, uh, I look at the Constitution as trumping any bill or law that's passed by our Congress. Um, the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and, and, and all of our rights and liberties protected by the Constitution can't be overcome by an act of Congress. This Constitution is beautiful because it was created by people suspicious of government that had been offended by their sovereign, by their king. And they said never again, and so they put these rights and protections in place. And so, you know, if, if the bill allows United States citizens to be detained without their constitutional rights and violates those, then I would say it's a violation of our rights. Um, you know, if we, if we lose our Constitution, 
we lose everything. Um, you know, I'm gravely concerned about this president. I'm gravely concerned about the NSA and spying on its citizens. And um, you know, we, if we are starting to put people in prison without due process and without um, probable cause and without all of the, the protections we have, then we have crossed the Rubicon, and we should be gravely concerned about that. And so, you know, for me, the Constitution is 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 the ultimate arbiter of any of these kind of issues, and it can't be overcome no matter how much Congress wants to try to pretend to protect our citizens. I agree. The Constitution is there to protect us. Some of you guys have heard me talk about being nostalgic. I often think about colonial times and what our forefathers would do. And here we are sitting in a, a classroom. They didn't have too many universities to have candidate forms 200 years ago. But if you think about, though, what would our forefathers think if we told them, well, you know what? We're kind of afraid that you might be on the side of the British, so we're going to detain you for a little bit. No, they wouldn't stand for that. That's why we have a constitution. That's why you're guaranteed due process. That's why you're guaranteed a speedy trial. Indefinite detention on suspicion is wrong. Thank you. I agree with my uh, colleagues up here. Um, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act contains uh, issues that violate the 4th and 5th and 14th Amendments of the Constitution and therefore should be struck down. You must remember back in history, 1798, the Alien and Sedition Acts, there were four acts that were passed uh, that were there. You could be jailed for speaking against the government. Imagine if those Alien and Sedition Acts were in place today. I think they are. Mm -hmm. I think we're very close to that very same element here. And it had it not been for Thomas Jefferson and the Supreme Court of the United States to strike, and the Congress, the Republican Congress, to strike down those laws, we probably would have had a legacy that we would regret still today. I want you to all to understand, <clears throat> I nearly lost my job when the Patriot Act was uh, first brought forward. I fought uh, uh, inside the Department of Homeland Security uh, against the Patriot Act because I felt that the Patriot Act would be abused. We would violate the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, and we have, and I hate saying I told you so, I kept my job, but I think you just need to understand there are people out there that understand this and will fight courageously to protect American citizens. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to have Mr. Shaven answer this question first again. Um, almost every mm -hmm. estimate says the Social Security system will not be around for younger people come 40 or 50 years from now. Should young people be able to opt out of Social Security? What would you do to assure young people that the system will still be there for them? It's a great question and, and a very astute observation. Yes, Social Security is going broke. Most people my age and younger already understand that. Should people be able to opt, opt out? I don't see a problem with it. Um, the biggest thing is, is we have to be able, before we do any major changes, we have to be able to ensure that we keep the promises tomorrow that we make today. Meaning, those that are going to be dependent on Social Security, and whether the magic number is 40 years old or 35 years old or 30 years old, what have you, or 50 years old, whatever, we have to be, have it, if we do any changes, we have to give those that the changes will be made for time to prepare for it. So whether you're 35 years old and the federal government tells you, hey, you got 30 years to prepare for retirement on your own, whether you go to something like a, a single payment system or a double-decker system, means testing Social Security. Something obviously has to be done to it because the amount of money and the way how much Social Security spending is growing, it's going to be broke soon. We've got to get more people uh, paying into it, our population needs to grow, but also there needs to be some sort of a change or a restructure to it. So, yes, I can see that. I'm okay. As long as it can sustain itself, I'm okay with people opting out, yes. Which is never gonna happen. <laughs> First, we need to make sure that those that are on Social Security or close to retirement, um, you know, this, we are not talking about doing anything to change that system. We've made those obligations, we've made those promises. My parents' generation, 
um, should be ensured that we're going to live up to those promises. Um, but that does not mean that it is completely inflexible. I'm part of a generation that before I could vote, my retirement age was raised to 67. I know many in this room had a similar experience. Um, what I have talked about when it comes to Social Security is this is an area where we need to drop our partisan swords and our partisan shields. And we don't need a Democrat solution. We don't need a Republican solution. You've heard me talk about we need an American solution. Because there, these problems can be fixed <coughs> if people come in good faith to the table and resolve it. Uh, but <coughs> right now, too often, our sometimes friends on the left make it score political points and try to, to get votes by scaring seniors. And we need to put that down. And we need to solve this problem. It can be solved. And it's actually not that complicated of a solution if everybody acted in good faith. Well, I'm closer to that retirement age than anybody else up here. <laughs> and in fact, my wife already is at that age. Um, uh, I think that I have always advocated, and I've made it very clear, that I would like to see uh, private templates available uh, for individuals to opt in or out of this system and the particular system. I think it's very important for us to keep the promises, and, and I have it broken down. Age 55 and above, you are in the system now, you stay in that system. 45 to 55, you have the opportunity to opt in or out uh, to the system. Below the age of 45, you have a modernized uh, private uh, template that you can use. You invest your, your income in that money. It's your account, it's not the federal government's account. The account survives you. The account belongs to your estate. The account goes to your estate if you pass before retirement age. That is the way this system ought to work. We can do the very same thing with Medicare, and I think this is something I think is very important. My wife and I are both, uh, my wife is on Medicare right now, and I will be uh, entering Medicare this year myself. So these are the kinds of things that I think are very necessary for your generation, for you, because I think it's important for you to be able to have some sustainment and have control of things yourselves and thus be accountable to yourselves for your futures. What a concept. All right, question number 11. Um, an ongoing issue in Crimea has created tense talks between the United States and Russia. Do you believe the, ple the people of Crimea have the right to self-determination as laid out in the UN chapter? Should the U.S. be more involved, less involved, and what role should we play when dealing with Russia? During my turn in the United States <coughs> Pentagon, and when I was serving in the Pentagon, I was a, a Sovietologist, I was a Russian expert, and uh, uh, I picked up some experience in working in the Middle East. Um, my view of this is Crimea is uh, ethnic Russian. Uh, Ukraine is an area that actually where the Russian Empire was born. Uh, this exercise is as Russian as the day is long. Vladimir Putin is acting as a Russian, not as a communist, not as a Soviet, uh, not in, in any other form or fashion. So I think that what we're seeing right now is the, is the Russian empire reestablishing its, its borders. What I think we ought to do is to make it very clear to uh, the, the nations that border uh, Ukraine, such as Moldova, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, Poland, the, and, and the uh, Baltic states, to make clear to them that we are part of NATO, we want them to be part of NATO, we want them to be part of the Western economic system, I think that's really what we ought to do, and I think the boldest step we could take is to renew our, our missile ballistic defense system and take it into Poland and land it there. That's pretty demonstrative. And I think other than that, we really ought to just not try to get involved in that at all, it's, it, because it's not going to end well for anybody if we do. Before doing anything, with other countries, getting involved in other countries' conflicts, we need to know what we're getting involved with. The role yeah. of a United States Senator is to help oversee foreign policy and not dictate it. Otherwise, you'd have 100 people in the Senate telling us, telling us what to do, and over 400 people in the House of Representatives, you'd have 500 people in Washington trying to dictate policy. The other thing we have to do, and you have to be very careful as a candidate, but we must do it we must become very educated before we talk about it. As a, as a senator, you should be able to report back 
to your constituents what's going on, but you also have to walk that fine line between uh, giving away intelligence and giving away proper information and relaying to your constituents what's going on. I don't think anybody up here is sending on an intelligence briefing in the better, better part of a decade. And we have to keep in mind what's actually, before spouting off about what we should or shouldn't do, we need to know truly what's going on. And we need to know the truth. I look at my own self and my career in the Navy. First night we ever shot missiles, we were told that building was full of chemical weapons. A couple days later, we had an admiral on my ship. 100%, that building was full of chemical weapons. Four months later, that building was full of baby aspirin. Right. So before we do anything, we need tonight. to know exactly what we're doing. Crimea should be allowed to self-determine, uh, but they're facing, and Ukraine is facing, a very uh, determined Russia that wants to expand beyond its current borders. Um, I think we should do more than economic sanctions against individuals um, like we have seen this president do. I would like to see some economic sanctions against Russia. I think they should pay a price for expanding into Crimea and uh, currently looking over the border at Ukraine. Um, but I disagree fundamentally with John McCain, for example, and that's a familiar thing for me to say. I don't agree with him much at all. Uh, but I disagree. I don't think we should be sending uh, even non-lethal aid to Ukraine. Um, we need to have a strong NATO, and we need to have a strong European Union. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is to export natural gas to the European Union so that they don't have to depend as much on Russian natural gas that about 70% is piped right through Ukraine. And if we could give them a little more energy independence from Russia, then Europe would be able to better take care of this problem and uh, we could diplomatically support them with that. Okay, question number 12. Uh, last week the House passed Paul Ryan's budget. What are your thoughts on his budget proposal? Are there parts that you enthusiastically agree with, and is there anything you might suggest be done differently? No, there's not much enthusiasm in a budget that doesn't balance uh, as far as the eye can see. Uh, I mean, I guess the only enthusiasm is it's better than President Obama's budget, um, which you know grows the national debt to $25 trillion. Um, we have a serious spending problem on our hands. And one of the rules uh, that I learned growing up in Ankeny is when you find yourself in a hole, you stop digging. And right now, the United States of America, as we continue to deficit spend and not make the tough choices in Washington, D.C., um, is, is just, it's, it's, it's completely detached from reality. And I, I've been clear, I've, I've talked about aid to countries that don't like us very much is one opportunity, aid to the U.N. is another opportunity, getting rid of baseline budgeting is another opportunity to move closer to balancing the budget. I've also talked about giving managers in the federal government, which I worked for five and a half years, a little less year over year and making them manage. But ultimately what I'd like to see is a balanced budget amendment to our nation's constitution. I think it's the only way that we will have serious budget reform in our country. You know, one U.S. Senate vote, one U.S. Senator voting yes for a balanced budget amendment in the 1990s would have changed the course of history for America ever since then, but we didn't get it done. And we need to get it done now. One of my favorite sayings when it comes to money is millionaires don't use the credit card to go to the movies. Millionaires use the credit card to, for investments to make more money. We cannot keep going further in debt. Regarding the most recent budget, it takes 10 years just to balance it. And they think that's great. I think it's atrocious. My litmus test, and I've been clear on this since day one, I want a path to solvency. I want our nation out of debt. I don't want our state in debt. Forty years ago, last time this Senate seat was open, our entire nation's debt was $500 billion. Our leaders in Washington told us we can't afford to pay off $500 billion. So we got a great idea. We're going to go further in debt. 
And now every year they, we pay magically 200 billion just in interest. <laughs> we need to not only right the ship, we need to turn it around and start creating a path to solvency. We need somebody to go to DC and not be afraid to put everything on the table and not be afraid to face the big decisions and not be afraid to risk being voted out of office for doing the right thing. Thank you. Since 1932, 82 budgets have been proposed and of those 82 budgets, only 12 delivered a surplus to the Treasury of the United States. Only 12. Six times Democrats were in control of Congress, six times Republicans were in control of Congress. This is a blight on both houses. Deficit spending is wrong and it needs to be stopped immediately. I'm not in favor of this budget. I would never be in favor of this budget. I agree that we need a balanced budget amendment. I think we need to freeze spending, freeze it right now today, freeze spending until such time as the revenues of the Treasury of the United States exceed the expenditures. And then whatever is there to exceed the expenditures is then applied directly to the debt of the United States. I think what you do then is you take the hammer and put it in the hands of Congress where it should be, you put it in the hands of the people, and it forces the executive branch of the United States government to manage the money like you and I have to in our businesses. And I think that's the, the, the appropriate way to go. And it also, by the way, makes the budget easy because all you have to do is duplicate it 10 times and turn it in. Then you just sign it once, there you go. All right, once again, I'm gonna have Mr. Shaven answer this question first. Um, gun violence has taken, a place, uh, has taken place at a number of schools in recent years. What steps do you think should be taken to prevent future mass shootings in public places? How should our Second Amendment rights be protected while doing our best to reduce crime? Great question. Defending our Second Amendment. Supporting our Second Amendment. Great slogans that fit on bumper stickers at Buicks that lots of politicians see in parking lots and they come into forums like this and rattle them off. I've been very clear on this. I'd like to see a 50-state concealed carry permit that the everyday citizen can attain. Right now, if you, cook, if you want to go to Illinois or Minnesota, you have to pull over to the side of the road to put something in the trunk. Otherwise, you become a criminal in a neighboring state. We have over a quarter million concealed carry permit holders in this country. We need to allow people to be able to defend themselves including teachers and school administrators. And for that matter, on college campuses, we need to allow the students to be able to defend themselves. As long as you can prove that you're not a dangerous person, I don't see a problem with the everyday citizen attaining a concealed carry permit. I've been endorsed by the Gun Owners of America. I'm a concealed carry permit holder, and I don't have to go far to find a gun, so I'll just leave it at that. <coughs> I uh, also uh, made the statement, and it'll be on the TV this weekend uh, with Dan Winters, uh, that we ought to lift the, the uh, gun-free zones on our military installations and allow our soldiers to defend themselves. We, we allow them to take a gun into combat. I think we ought to allow them to keep guns in their houses and, and protect themselves and protect each other. That's what soldiers do. They protect each other. Um, I really think that this is uh, uh, one of the great challenges that we have here is not on gun violence because uh, there are 100 million gun owners in America that own 300 million guns. And all of us, most of us, are responsible people. What we really are focused, ought to focus on is the mental health issues that exist because of the last five mass shootings, all of these were young white males who had mental health issues that were, had been identified and they needed help in that area and not necessarily in gun control because that's really what we're talking about here. If we want to control guns, the, the more uh, the guns you have in a free society, the less likely you're going to have those kind of outbreaks again. I guess I have more than my fair share, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, many of you know that, uh, that I've been local counsel of the NRA and the 
uh, I, we were there when the Iowa Firearms Coalition was born. Um, and, you know, I've been a strong advocate for the Second Amendment. Um, I believe that, um, you know, gun owners, the more the merrier. I'd rather have a restaurant full of concealed carry permit holders than a restaurant that has none. And I just believe that, you know, our Second Amendment rights are just so endeared. But, you know, I, I share the concern uh, about mental health. And I share the concern that, you know, sort of common sense, uh, you know, mental health um, uh, exchange of information isn't happening as it should across our nation. And so, you know, for me, um, I believe in an armed citizenry, citizenry uh, both for recreational use and for personal protection. And it's, uh, it's a basic tenet. Uh, of our of our fundamental constitutional rights, and so uh, you know, how do we prevent mass shootings? Um, you know, it's it's a difficult challenge. Uh, we need to make sure that we get people the mental health um, resources and, uh, and the doctors and the support that they need. And it's also making sure that anywhere that a uh, that a shooter is, that there's folks that are willing to defend um, our fellow citizens. Thank you. Um, that concludes the question portion of our debate. Um, we will now move on to the closing remarks. Each candidate now has the opportunity to give a one-minute closing remark. Um, we'll start with Mr. Clovis. And <coughs> like it or not, we get to stand up for this part. We've been sitting a long time. <coughs> I think tonight is an excellent demonstration of people that care enough to come out and meet the primary voters that uh, we expect to deal with and to answer those hard questions. And I think, again, I'm going to make this very clear. You must be present to win. The issue that I want to announce here is you have to be able to have the conviction, the commitment, the courage, and the concern to be out here today to come in and talk to voters. And if you're not here, you don't deserve to be in this race. I'd like to backtrack just a couple of questions quickly. When it comes to foreign aid, much like tonight, you can't buy friends. And everybody here tonight, I'm pretty sure we're not in a room full of maxed out donors to these three candidates. So I'd like to thank you, friends, for coming here tonight. Um, I'm an everyday Iowan ready to represent everyday Iowans. And I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Again, my biggest stuff though is the path to solvency, the 50 state concealed carry. We didn't get into it tonight, but clearly defined veterans benefits so our veterans do know on the day of discharge exactly which benefits they will or will not receive before ever leaving base. Thank you for the time. Lots of familiar faces and I, and I appreciate your passion because it is your passion that even though that may have to shine through come June 14th. All right. Thank you. I'm Matt Whitaker, I'm running for the U.S. Senate. I'm asking for your vote June 3rd. I'm running on a platform of standing up for liberty and freedom. Freedom from Obamacare. We didn't get to talk a lot about it, but it's a $1.2 trillion wet blanket on our nation's economy. Economic freedom. We are now 12th in the world on economic freedom. Right behind that beacon of economic freedom, Estonia. And I also want to stand up for religious liberty. I think this administration, more than any administration in our nation's history, has been inflicting and advancing against our religious liberties. And while we're at it, we need to stand up for our Second Amendment rights. We need to stand up for our Fourth Amendment rights. I believe that this election is about standing up for freedom, which I have talked about being the calling of our time. Join me in this effort. We need your help. We need your prayers. God bless America. Thank you. All right, that marks the end of the Grandview University United States Senate Candidate Debate Forum. Uh, thank you to everyone involved that made this event successful, and that includes all of the candidates and the campaigns for coming and engaging in respectful and friendly debate. And most of all, to all of you for coming.
coming and supporting this event. We sincerely appreciate it. Have a great night and drive safely.